Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, my name's Will and in this video I'd like to talk to you a bit about open and closed loop control. So starting to play with some robots and I've subtitled this one avoiding the rocks and following lines for reasons that will become apparent. But first I would like you to imagine that you are a ship at sea in the age of sail. Now you can't see any land on the horizon and the sky is all dark and stormy and you've got this question of where you are because you don't want to hit the rocks, run aground and sink. Well, there's some things that ships could measure. So one of the things that they would do is they would get a plank of wood and they would tie a rope around it. They'd tie knots in the rope every so often and they would coil the rope up on the deck and then they'd throw the plank of wood into the water. And as they sailed along, the rope uh, would spill out behind them, uh, connected to this plank of wood floating in the ocean. And if you counted how many knots had been dragged over the back of the ship, well, that gave you your speed in knots. Uh, hopefully, you've got a good ship's compass and that'll give you your heading. And well, although it's dark and stormy, maybe at noon, maybe the sun is peeking through the clouds. And so maybe you can measure the angle of the sun from the horizon at noon and that angle of the sun at the horizon will give you your latitude, how far north or south you are on the globe. Maybe there's some other things you could do. So you might have some charts of the ocean, of the sea or the ocean's depth uh, around where you're sailing. And so you might be able to go, oh, well, I think I'm here and then take a depth measurement of the sea and work out, well, if that is where you are on the chart or not. But these measurements aren't perfect. You know, there might be a little bit of error in how you measure them. And some of them you can only measure occasionally. So if this is the latitude from the angle of the sun at noon, we can only really measure that at noon. We have to wait till the next day before we can measure it again. Um, there's no longitude here because um, early in the days of sail, they didn't have very good maritime clocks. And so they couldn't keep the time well enough uh, when they were sailing for days and rocking about on the ocean uh, to be able to compare when noon is where they are to where, when noon is in, in some reference point, Bristol or London or something like that, to work out their longitude. So they've got some measurements, but they've not got perfect measurements. And they some measurements they can only make every so often. So in the meantime, what they might have to do is sail by dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning is the idea that, well, yesterday I measured that my ship was in this location and I measured its velocity, uh, its speed was whatever this is, its speed was V, and I was sailing on this particular heading. So if I have been sailing for a day at that heading, at that speed from here, then I ought to be here. But it's not going to be perfect. Perhaps my measurements weren't perfectly correct when I measured my heading or my speed, or perhaps they were. But while I've been sailing in this direction, the currents have been making me drift north. And so instead of being here where I think I am, I'm really here. And so these are the sorts of errors that you can get if you're sailing by dead reckoning. Now, let me show you a map. This here is a map of the English Channel. And so here's the English Channel. Here is my little drawing of England and the Isle of Wight. And there's the southern part of Wales. And this is a simplified version of France and Spain. And this here, these are the Scilly Isles, um, some rocky islands off the coast of Cornwall. And this part of Cornwall here, well, these days it's called Lizard Point. But um, in the 1700s, they would refer to it in documents as the Lizard. This red dotted line is what Edmund Halley reckoned was the safest, uh, the kind of the safe latitude to enter the channel. Any further north from that, and you ran a risk of running into the Scilly Isles, running into the Lizard, or ending up the wrong side of the Scilly Isles and the Lizard and sailing up the Bristol Channel instead of the English Channel. So let us try to sail the English Channel. Uh, on this screen here, I have my intrepid ship, HMS Turtle Graphics. And so because this is turtle graphics, I'm going to use my turtle graphics commands. I'm going to tell it turn left 30 degrees, go forward 600 pixels. Maybe they're nautical pixels. Uh, turn right 20 degrees, go forward 20, uh, 300 pixels. And let us see uh, if this will let us sail HMS turtle graphics uh, up the English Channel. And so we'll go forward 600 
uh, right 20 degrees and then forward 300 pixels. And if I play that, this should work. There we go, HMS Total Graphics sails forward 600 degrees, turns right uh, a bit and sails up the English Channel quite nicely. Now, because this is a computer program and neatly deterministic, I could run that again and get the same result. So let me just put my finger that you can't see on the screen on the um, on that particular junction. Let me reset that, rerun the program, and I think uh, that we should go nice and repeatedly change in just the same spot. And we do. So because this is a computer program, it all behaves nice and deterministically. But if this was a real ship at sea, would it do that? The winds are changing, the you're being tossed by the ocean, the currents are making you drift, maybe your heading reading wasn't perfect. And so, well, what would happen if I was a little bit wrong? And so because of some of these, I wasn't quite heading in the direction I thought. Maybe I was five degrees out before I started. Uh, well, in that case, my poor little sailing ship uh, would sail this way and would run into the Silly Isles. And if it missed the Silly Isles, it might run into the Lizard. Now, this isn't just a problem that we see in computer pro uh, programs. Historically, this was the case. Um, so this engraving is of the Silly Naval Disaster of 1707. Now that there is HMS Association having struck rocks at the Silly Isles, sinking. Two other ships alongside uh, HMS Association also struck the rocks and sank, and another one that struck the rocks was damaged but managed to get off the rock, rocks and, and, and make its, its way on. Uh, but so this was a big, big problem. Um, that's my little bit of a segue into the topic that we're going to talk about. So let's talk a little bit about open loop control and closed loop control, start introducing the terminologies. So a lot of control systems that we see, especially lots of older ones, they just have to follow a fixed set of instructions. Let's leave ships aside just for the moment. Let's think about an old dishwasher. They might load up with dishes and you set it going and it tries to drain any water that's in there out. And maybe it then runs on rinse for 20 minutes. Then it drains the water out. Then it opens the flap to let the soap in. Then it runs uh, the wash again for another half an hour. Then it drains the water out. Then it runs on rinse for another 10 minutes or so uh, and then it drains the water out and then it uh, cools down and hopefully your plates are ready. Well that's a fixed cycle. Uh, it's not necessarily sensed anything in that if it's one of these older style dishwashers. An old clothes dryer you might set it that I want to run my clothes dryer for half an hour and it would start counting the half an hour and maybe the last 10 minutes you know the, maybe to begin with it turns the heater on uh, but it's got an internal mechanism so when the timer hits 10 minutes it'll turn the heater off and so the air blowing through the through through the uh, the clothes will gradually get cooler for the last 10 minutes um, and then it will stop regardless of whether your clothes are dry um, our turtle graphics was effectively doing the whole thing, well, actually slightly even, even worse than Dead Reckoning, because our turtle had no idea where it was to start with. It doesn't know where it is now. Uh, our turtle just followed the instructions, turn left 30 degrees, forward 600 pixels, right 20 pixels, forward 300, and it did it even if our position was wrong, and so that was how we struck the Silly Isles in, in that example. Um, a robot, some robots like Sphero, which is a little ball shaped robot, one of the common things you might do with that is to tell it to follow a set path, go forwards a certain distance, then turn right and go forwards a bit more. Um, and it will faithfully reproduce those instructions, but it might, you know, hit a tuft of carpet or something and get knocked off course and not know it and still just be going forwards and then right and end up in a different spot. And your dishwasher. Um, well, maybe your dishes don't come out clean because maybe you put in particularly dirty dishes that day um, or maybe it ends up wa wa wasting water because actually you put in very clean dishes that day. But because it's running a fixed cycle, uh, it can't adapt to what your dishes are really like and how well it's cleaning them. Um, maybe your clothes that you put in the dryer and you ran it for half an hour, maybe they're not dry at the end of the cycle and it's stopped after half an hour, even though your clothes are still wet. Um, the ship, while it is having to sail by dead reckoning, its position might be wrong. Uh, Sphero might hit that tuft in, in, in the carpet. Uh, so this is a difference between computer programs and robotics, essentially. Um, our graphics turtle, if we remove the little error that I've introduced, 
it can run reliably because our program is deterministic inside this computer as I've written it. Um, but in the real world, controlling robots, actual sensors and actuators, it doesn't always work perfectly like that. We'll see some examples with robots a little bit later on, uh, even in some quite simple exercises. Um, so if that's open loop control, then what's closed loop control? Well, closed loop control, at some point we want to close the loop and sense or measure whether we're in the state we think we are, how we're going. Uh, and so ships would occasionally try and measure their position so that they could correct that error, work out where they are after a time. Um, clothes dryers, modern ones, might have a moisture sensor in them that can sense the amount of moisture that is in the air that they are blowing through your clothes. And from that, work out, well, OK, your clothes are now dry, so I'm going to stop. Uh, dishwashers, similarly, they might uh, determine how dirty your plates are from when it's doing the initial rinse or something like this. You know, perhaps it would check how much uh, dirt is in the water that comes off from the beginning of the rinse. Um, different ways that these, th these things might start to try and take measurements of how they're going. Uh, now, sometimes you can take good measurements, sometimes you can't, and you have to work with the information you can get. Um, so, for instance, in my sailing example, the ships would be measuring their latitude at noon, but they might have to sail by dead reckoning in between. They might periodically be able to take sounding of the seabed, but maybe they can't do it while they're being tossed and turned and the, and the, the sailing is quite rough. Um, Various times, they, you know, maybe they spot some land and so then through the telescope, they're trying to work out um, what their position is from what they can see. Um, often you'll be trying to improve the measure measurements that you can make. Um, so in my sailing example, one of the famous e examples was uh, the longitude prize, uh, which was to try and solve this problem that, uh, well, ships could measure their latitude uh, from the angle of the sun at noon. But if you wanted to measure your longitude, how far east and west on the globe you were, uh, if you wanted to do that from what time noon is locally compared to, say, Bristol or London or, or wherever you sailed from, um, well, to do that, you'd need an accurate clock that could tell you what the time was in the port you departed from. And that clock needed to keep accurate even when you were sailing on the ocean, being tossed and turned and rocking and rolling uh, over days or weeks. And so the Longitude Prize was a, a series of prizes for things to improve things like maritime clocks that could work at sea. So you could work so ships could better calculate their longitude, not just their latitude. OK, that's all well and good. Lots of uh, examples like this. But what are we actually going to do? Well, one of the things I would like to introduce you to uh, is some of the common computational thinking exercises that uh, children often do in outreaches. And one of the most common is to get a robot to navigate its way through a maze without many sensors. So this is a photograph from one of these that we ran and uh, some people from Cisco very kindly helped us with. Uh, and so uh, there we have children sitting in groups uh, programming their robots to solve a maze uh, that in this case, look like this. And so this is a little uh, make block, uh, make bot, um, a, a small robot that has not very many sensors. It's got a range sensor on the front that can tell how far away obstacles are. So if it was staring at one of these walls, it would be able to spot that. And it has a line, couple of line sensors underneath uh, that can spot uh, whether a particular spot underneath the robot is light or dark. And so using just those sensors, it has to be able to navigate its way through the maze. Um, this one here, uh, this is the, 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 the same Cisco Coders Challenge that Cisco kindly uh, was, did so much the organisation and help from and brought their engineers up to, to, to work with the children uh, in the schools as well. And so in this case, uh, you can see a slightly bigger uh, make bot. Uh, this time one with a grabber arm and we can still see mazes on the floor although this time they're ones that don't have walls they're a, a, a maze that we created out of lines and we had some obstacles that we'd put on there and they had they would have to go and pick up the right one with a grabber arm um, this one same thing going on at another school uh, so lots and lots of getting robots to find their way around mazes uh, that are made up of lines uh, so let's keep on going and this one here, 
This is uh, basically a different robot, but a very similar kind of exercise. So this is a BitBot. Um, this was a shorter outreach that we ran um, as part of the Conoco uh, Philips science experience. And this here is a BitBot uh, that is a little robot that takes a micro bit um, kind of as the brains of the robot. And then the BitBot part is the chassis. Uh, but even though it looks a bit different, the sensors are pretty similar. It's still got a rangefinder on the front and it's got line sensors underneath for spotting uh, this black line. Um, it's a little different in that actually the, uh, the micro bits also got some sensors like an accelerometer on it as well. Um, so typically these challenges only have a couple of kinds of sensors to play with. So you've got a line sensor and the way that one works is it's a little LED that will shine a light a very short distance onto the onto the maze, onto the paper. Uh, right next to it is a light sensor that will see how much light gets reflected back. And so if lots of light gets reflected back, well, we must be on a white part of the paper, we're not on the line. If very little light gets reflected back, well, we must be on a black part of the, bla uh, the paper, we're on the line. And there's a range sensor that can detect if obstacles are in front of the robot and roughly how far away they are. And so the first challenge we've got given that these are the only sensors we've got to work with, the first challenge is just, uh, well, let's just get the robot to follow the line to begin with, and then we'll work out navigating our way around it. Okay. If you have a robot, it may have those sensors in different arrangements, and you might find yourself following the line differently. Uh, what I've got here, this one, this robot here is called Edison. Um, I've photographed it from the bottom. Uh, that is the actual robot sitting on my iPad. It's not, not just a picture of the robot on, on the screen. And you can probably see that it's got these circles. Well, that's because it's designed so that it'll fit together with Lego blocks. I happen to leave a couple of Lego blocks inside a couple of the motors on the, on the, on the side here when I photographed it. Uh, you can program it from an iPad. Um, it's got three different ways of programming it. You can program it in Python if you like text languages, but or there's a couple of different styles of blocks language you can use to program this robot. Underneath, um, those two holes there, that are, those are actually to do with how you program it. This one, um, when you want to program your robot, rather than doing it over USB, you can do it over an audio cable. So um, basically you plug uh, your the cable into the headphone jack of the iPad and you get it to play the program in sound that then gets uh, read in uh, over over uh, over that that particular wire into those uh, particular ports in inside the Edison, and that solves the problem of well, what version of USB do you have, etc. Uh, so long as you've got a headphone jack, um, this part here though is the light sensor, and there's only one of them. So you can see that there's an LED and there's a light sensor. And so that is looking at one spot underneath the robot, uh, somewhere in front of the wheels. Uh, so how do you follow a line if you can only see one spot uh, in front of you? Uh, well, what you might do is decide that you're going to wobble along the edge of the line. If you see white, then turn left. And if you see dark, then turn right. And so you should find yourself wobbling along. We'll see that. We'll try it out in a moment. Same iPad, different robot different programming environments as well. So this one here, this is BitBot that I talked about before. So you can, uh, again, I photographed it from underneath so that we can have a look at the line sensors. Um, but you can just see in the background there that that is the micro bit that is the brains of the BitBot. Um, on the front, that there is the uh, the range sensor for obstacles in front of it. And you can see here, there's this time there's two line sensors and they're spaced, well, they're a little bit apart. And so you've got the LED and the, uh, the shining some light and a, and a sensor receiving it. And so we're looking at two spots on the ground spaced a fair way apart. And so, um, well, maybe the way that we would follow uh, the line is to straddle the line. And so long as they're both white, uh, we've got the line between us and that's good. Uh, but if we uh, start seeing uh, the right one turn dark, well, we've drifted too far to the left to so go right a bit. And if we see the left one turn dark, we've drifted too far to the right to so turn left a bit. And then you've also got this question of, well, what do you do when they both turn dark? Are you at a T-junction? Uh, what do you want to do in that situation? Um, this one here, uh, this is the make bot that had the grabber arm attached. And you can see still a similar style of sensors. You've still got a range sensor on the front. And in this case, you've got the two line sensors just down here, quite close to the line. And they are quite close together. And so if you're doing stuff with those sorts of uh, uh, make, block, make bots, 
um, then you would uh, perhaps want to see if uh, if you can keep both of the sensors inside the line. And so you can go travel along if they're both dark and if one of them turns light where well, you've strayed off the edge of the line and you need to uh, course correct. Um, that can uh, be one approach to it. You can also do slightly different things. So there's nothing stopping us from, for instance, instead of doing that, deciding, no, I'm going to follow the left edge of the line. And so what I want to keep is the left one showing whiteness and the right one showing darkness. And then I know that I'm following the left edge of the line. Uh, we'll try these out in a moment. Uh, but I said I would talk about this issue of sensors not working perfectly. Uh, let's show a couple of examples. Well, I'll talk about a couple of examples that I've hit even with these simple kinds of robot. Uh, so we've got the bitbot on the left, and we've got the make block on the right, and these are two real occasions that happened in these outreaches. In the one on the left, uh, well, I painted these lines just using some acrylic paint, trying to make them nice and rough so that you could start uh, moving around. I thought we might play with what the accelerometer readings were from, uh, from the bitbot. Uh, but I noticed that some of the bits of the line turned out a little bit light. And so sometimes the bitbot would go, no, I'm still seeing light. That's not line. And it would mistake uh, the line for the paper because too much light was coming back off that acrylic paint on the paper. Um, if you laser print things, it seems to work very well, by the way. Um, this one on the right, this uh, same sort of story, but a different way that it happened. Um, we had these mazes printed up on uh, plastic material. And when they did the draft ones, they used a relatively inexpensive matte plastic material. And it all worked beautifully. And then the print shop said, well, we're going to print the real ones now. And they printed it just on a slightly different material that was glossier. And so even though the line was printed nice and black, because the plastic was that little bit glossy, there was still too much reflection of the light uh, from the LED in the line sensor. And so the robot wasn't thinking that it was seeing the line. It would, too much light was coming off the glossiness um, of the plastic and it thought, no, there's no line there. And so uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it in the picture, but what we ended up having to do very quickly uh, was to tape over those lines uh, with black, I can't remember if it was electrical tape or duct tape, uh, but some kind of black tape that it was successfully uh, seeing as being that's really black. So even with sensors, just as simple as a line sensor, you can get these kind of interactions where things don't always work perfectly in the real world. It's not as neat always as just a computer program because you have to deal with, uh, with sensors not reading quite, quite right, etc. OK, that is enough talking about that for the moment. Let us start implementing something and play around with following some lines. So what I'm doing here, I have a version of my Turtle Graphics Turtle that I have altered. And so this Turtle Graphics Turtle, I can add a line sensor to. And so if I add a line sensor, I might want to say, let me add a line sensor 50 pixels in front of me still on the central axis, so no pixels off the uh, down or up. Um, and well, what colors would I like it to be sensitive to? I would like it to be fully sensitive, 255 to red, uh, 255 to green, and I would like it not to be sensitive to blue. The reason I'd like it not to be sensitive to blue is that to make it easier to see what's going on, I've also drawn these blue grid lines on the background and I don't want it to get fooled by the by the grid lines. So let us make our light sensor insensitive to blue. Um, if I just click run on that, we won't see much except this little circle appear in front of us, which is our, um, our line sensor. And it's showing black because it's seeing that line. Um, However, let us do some Edison-like wobbling along the edge of the line. So let me say, while true, what I would like to do is I would like to read from sensor. Well, this is the first one that I've added. So this is going to be sensor number zero. So we're starting at zero. And that is going to give me a number between zero and one, uh, which is about how much light that line sensor is seeing. And so if it is seeing, should we say uh, if it's seeing more than a half, then we're going to say that it's uh, bright. Uh, and if it's seeing less than a half, let's say that it's dark. So if that C, well, if it's less than 0.5 and we're on the line, I'm going to make it turn left a bit. So I'm going to make it go left five degrees. Otherwise, I'm going to make it turn right five degrees. And then I'm going to make it go forward by five pixels. 
And so now we should see our Edison like uh, Turtle Graphics um, um, robot wobbling along fairly neatly. And so it wobbles along the edge of the line, it'll hit this corner and it won't get it perfectly, but it'll curve round and there we go, it manages to follow this part of the line. Again, it's going to overshoot at the end, uh, but it will creep round and then it will uh, head up to this part here. And uh, let's see what it does on that jagged, sticky, outy bit. And so it sees it turns left, oops, loops off, but it kind of manages to find its way around uh, back onto the line. Um, you'll notice that because I've been laying down this uh, kind of salmon y color, um, it's not seeing the salmon y color as being so dark. So it's now trying to follow the edge between where it painted and the, uh, and the black line. I tell you what, let us change that. So I'm going to do two things. I am going to tell my line turtle that I would like its color now to be blue, the color it's not sensitive to. And I'm gonna change the composite mode. Um, so this is kind of because it's a um, turtle graphics program that I've written in the browser, I can do this. Uh, but I'm gonna tell it instead of just laying it down and laying the color over the top, like it's paint obliterating the color underneath, I would like it um, instead to lighten the color underneath. And so what this should mean is because I've said this is blue, so blue part of the pixel I want fully bright, and so it's going to lighten the blue part of the pixel until the blue values are fully bright, um, but because the, the, the red and the green parts that I'm laying down are zero and it's only doing lightening, it shouldn't affect the red and the green of the pixels. And so it should only lay down blueness, um, which is the color that we're not sensitive to, and so hopefully that means that I can now get it to paint what it's doing uh, without affecting what it reads uh, back off the canvas again. And so as you can see, um, well, as we'll see in a moment when uh, I think it's going to overshoot at the end down here. Yep. And so we can see that where there where it was already um, white, it didn't change the pixels. And so those should still read uh, as being not line, um, but the blue should end up still reading as line. And so that should now, there we go, it's still following the edge of the old line, even though it's colored it blue. Um, all right, so that was Edison's version. Uh, let us instead, well, let's keep the color and the composite mode. Uh, but now let's, instead of doing it Edison-like with one line sensor, let's start adding two line sensors. Um, let's clear that part of the program. And so if I'm going to add another line sensor, well, I don't want to add them both in the same spot because then they just read the same color. So maybe we'll put one of them uh, left of sensor, so this way by eight pixels. And maybe we'll put this one down here by eight pixels. And so that now shows these two relatively close together. And so this being a bit Makebot-like. And so now maybe our line follower, what should we do? Let's go and let's read the left sensor. So the left one was the first one, so that'd be sensor zero. And let's read um, the right sensor, which should now be sensor one. And well, that, th those are gonna give me numbers between zero and one. I tell you what, let us still say that what I want to know um, is is that bigger than 0.5? Uh, is it seeing lots of light or not very much light? Okay, so then I've got a few different conditions because I could have the condition where they're both seeing light. I could have the condition where the left one's seeing light and the right one's seeing dark. Um, I could have the condition where the left one's seeing dark and the right one is seeing light. And I could have the other condition, which is if they are uh, both seeing dark. Uh, now in this case, um, both seeing dark is means that we're on the line. So let's just keep going forward five pixels. Um, now, what about the other ones? Well, if they are, let's do, if the left one is dark and the right one uh, sorry, if the left one is light and the right one is dark, then we've shifted off that way a bit. So let us turn uh, right uh, by a few degrees. And if the left one is dark, but the right one's come off the edge, then let us turn left uh, by a few degrees. And well, let's just run that and see what happens for a moment. And so we can see that we go OK for a while. 
And then we are going to hit the end and stop because they've both turned light. So we're going to need to do something about when we just run off the end of this very square junction. Uh, and so what I'm going to suggest is that let us go um, back a little bit. So I just go back a tiny bit and let's just nudge ourselves right a little bit because we know that this is a clockwise circuit. So let's now run that. And so we go nicely along the line there, quite predictably because we've not got errors in the wheels. And then, yep, it manages to nudge its way around and it goes down this way and, yep, a bit of back and forth, but it manages to nudge its way around. And so now it is heading up this curve OK. And, oh, it kind of gets stuck up here uh, in this little dead end part. That's kind of what I put the dead end part there for. All right, let's do a different strategy. We said that we could alternatively get this thing to follow one of the edges. Um, shall we get it to follow the inside edge? Because uh, if we go around the inside edge, we're not going to see that dead end. Um, so in that case, we want the uh, the left one on black and the white one on right. So this is the one where we want to go forward five. Um, if instead we are seeing um, that the left and the right are both black, where well, we're inside the lights, so we want to go right a bit. And if instead we are seeing that the left one is light and the right one's black, well, we're kind of over this edge of the line. Um, so in that case, I guess we want to go um, in that. Well, let's yeah, let's go right a bit there. Uh, in this case here, if they're both on, uh, well, I guess we're off on the inside patch, maybe because we're trying to hog this corner. So hopefully we haven't got out here, but we might be in this patch in here. And so instead, let us uh, try and turn left for that part. So this is all kind of just making it up as I go along a little bit. And then we'll just see how it behaves and we'll try it out. And so that is managing to find that edge and it goes along and oh, it manages to wiggle its way around. And yep, it is managing just about to follow the inside of that line. So that was a different strategy. Uh, for following this line using a make block uh, style um, sensor where the, the two line sensors are quite close together. OK, if that's the case, let's now try the bitbot style where they're a little bit more spread out. And so in this case, let us put our um, sensors quite a bit further out. So is that that's hopefully far enough out. And so we've got one up here and we've got one down here. And so in that case, well, while true, and well, I still want to read from the left sensor. So I still want to say read sensor uh, zero and uh, is that bigger than 0.5 so that true is seeing light. Uh, is the sensor one, so that's the right hand side. Are we seeing whiteness or blackness from that side? Uh, so in this case, what are our conditions going to be? Um, well, in this case, uh, if we're seeing uh, light from both of them, then we just want to keep going straight ahead. Otherwise, uh, if left and not right, uh, so if the right one has gone dark, well, that probably means we're off to the left a little bit, so we want to turn right. Uh, else, if, uh, if the left one's dark and the right one is light, um, then what do we want to do there? Well, let's go left five and in the other condition where they're both on, uh, where they're both dark, sorry. Um, well, let's, ju let's just play it and just play this through and we'll work that out in a moment. So we've managing to hug that part of the line OK. And yeah, OK, we're going to get stuck there. OK, well, let's for first of all, let's follow the same sort of strategy that we did for the um, for the make block one where we were trying to keep them both on the line. Let's try when we get to that situation where they are both going off. Let's go back one and let's go um, right one. Sorry, let's go back one and right one and see if that helps us edge around. And so we'll just play that and we'll just see what happens. And it still kind of gets stuck. And in this case, I think the reason it gets stuck is because when we're turning five degrees, we're actually turning really quite a long way and we're sort of wobbling into it. So I say what, let's turn those down 
to turn right or left one degree. We could still get some oscillation, but we'll just see. We'll just try it and find out. And we kind of do. And so we're going, we're sort of stuck in this little bit of a loop. And so I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be cheeky and I'm going to introduce some bias to this. And I'm going to say, that in this case, I want to go right two degrees. And in this case, I only want to go left one degree. And we'll see if that helps it to get around this clockwise circle. And oh, in that case, it kind of hasn't. It kind of hasn't, has it? And so let's introduce a little bit more bias. Let's say that um, that we let's give them a different light level. So this isn't very scientific. This is just kind of playing around with it. And oh, that's still not sort of working. I tell you what, let's instead let's kind of if we're in that situation, let's loop around and see if we can find the line. So let's. Um, Let's go uh, forward a bit and right a bit so that we're not reversing and not getting stuck in that reverse oscillation. Let's try that. And so you do lots of playing around with different things uh, to see what will work for you. Oh, goodness, I've got I've got stuck on that particular case again. I tell you what, let's make ourselves go forward five instead of just one when we do that bit. And so we're doing lots of playing around just to try and help our robot to get through the maze. And so this is what a lot of these computational thinking tasks kind of turn into for a bit. You sort of see what goes wrong and you try different things and you play with them and you start seeing how they behave. And so this time now with a little bit of fiddling, uh, we've got it there. Uh, although, oops, actually it's going to um, start heading off to the left, but it made our lap of the circuit to begin with. Um, now, I could, of course, if I wanted, um, you know, even though those sensors are spaced further apart, I could go back to my, no, you know what, I want to put one of them on black and one of them on white, and I want to make it behave uh, more like my previous example that went round successfully. I could even decide, no, no, I'm just going to use one sensor to follow the line, a bit like my Edison, and then I'm going to use the other one to spot when junctions come up. I've got lots and lots of choices in how I do this, and so there's lots of, lots of playing around and having fun with these things. Um, all right. That was to show you these things in action and so that you can then play with this slide at home and program it in, in different ways. Um, though if you can get hold of the robots, they are a lot of fun to play with as well. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to introduce another quick little thing that I can, um, which is about stability. If you've got a robot, the sensor is where they put the sensor. You don't really get to move it around. Uh, but in this case, I do get to move around the sensors. And so this lets me show you something which is about uh, stability of control systems. Uh, so if I just decide what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a line sensor and I'm going to add it 50 pixels in front of me. Again, sensitive to red and green and not blue. And you'll see this time I've um, I've tried to make the, the lines that we leave behind show up a bit more by painting this stuff in yellow. But, I, but still, I'm going to be trying to make sure that the the blue value um, is the only one that, you know, so because these are yellow, they are they are they are lacking in blue, uh, but they should still show up OK uh, to our sensor uh, as being light. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say while true, I would like to let um, C be um uh, i want to read sensor uh from sensor zero and i want to say if c is less than 0.5 and uh, so if we're on black i want to go left a bit and otherwise i want to go right a bit and then i want to go forward a bit and i'm going to do my thing where i set the color of the pen to blue and i'm going to set the composite mode again to lighten and so this should now nicely do my edison like thing and you'll see it finds that edge pretty well and it wobbles okay along the edge let me show you something that happens if we change the position of the sensor so let's instead of putting it 50 pixels in front of us let us put it right under the central spot of the uh, the robot the the point that it turns around and now let's run this. And so we can see it loops left and it loops right. And it loops left and it loops right. And it keeps oscillating. And it is oscillating at the same 
um, the same deviation. So you can see these loops line up quite well with those lines and it never damps down to be smaller oscillations. Um, let's stop it and let's make it even worse. Let's put the sensor a little bit behind us. I think it will go two pixels behind us. And now it starts to oscillate and then it oscillates a little bit bigger and then it oscillates a little bit bigger again. And so our control system here has become unstable. It keeps overcorrecting and overcorrecting and overcorrecting and it goes unstable and it loses the line. And that will happen faster the further behind us we put the sensor. It just works out that that's an unstable configuration. And so in this case, I don't know if it's even going to manage two oscillations before it's lost the line again. Yep, there it goes, plowing off into the distance. It has lost the line really, really quickly. Whereas if I start to put the sensor in front of us, we start to introduce a little bit of damping into the control. And so you can see it's still oscillating, but each time the oscillations are getting a little bit smaller. And it goes over, over the edge and it's going to lose the thing. And in that case, well, it didn't dampen it enough. It sort of still went all the way through. I tell you what, let's put the sensor a little bit further in front of us and we should get a little bit more damping in the way our control system ends up working because we're, we're sensing ahead of where we're traveling. And so those oscillations die down a bit quicker. And this time, is it quite enough? Yep, it's just enough that we didn't stray over the line. And then the next time we're okay. And this will come around this side. And so this has introduced this damping. And with the sensor in front of us, we have a more stable uh, control system. Uh, so, of course, the way that I've been setting it up most of the time has been putting um, the sensor actually quite a bit further in front of us. And so, you know, that's at 10 pixels. We get a bit more damping and, it, you know, it's only a couple before it's wobbling quite happily along the side of the line. Uh, I think I put it 50 pixels in front of us. And so in that case, well, it damps so much that you don't even see uh, a single swing outside the line. Um, so this is just one of these things that you can have about stability of control systems. And I just wanted to show you because the fact that I could move this line sensor uh, made it easy for me to show you. Let's stop that one and keep going. So this photo here, this is not a photo that I've taken. This is actually, um, it, it, it's uh, a, a YouTube still. It's, it's off someone's video of a RoboCup Junior rescue line event somewhere in the world. Uh, and so this is a competition. Um, that, so RoboCup Junior runs competition for high school students and their rescue line version, uh, where we can see that it's got robots and there's lines to have to follow but there's various kind of obstacles like there's a gap in the line here and well here we've got a t-junction and we've got a little bit of a green square to say at this t-junction your robot must turn left at this t-junction it must turn left and then it's got to navigate past the break in the line and then at this point well this one it's got to turn right follow the curve around turn right again head off down this way um because this is done with real robots, you've got things like bridges as well. And RoboCup Rescue Line uh, some years also has a, a patch where once you get into this area here, you've got to go around and instead of using the line sensor to follow the lines, you're using the uh, obstacle sensor to find the obstacles that you've got to pick up uh, with your grabber arms. Um, uh, sorry, that should say rescue, not resuse. Um, uh, I will fix that up in, in the slides. Uh, but so the, the, the reason it's called rescue is because it's off this, uh, this theme of your robot is going into a disaster area into a chemical spill and it's got to um, drop the rescue the, the survival packs off to people or it's got to pick up um, the survivors and move and move them out of the way etc and so that is a little bit of an ex exercise that we're going to somewhat try and simulate uh, in tutorial exercises uh, and so um, there'll be a couple of versions you might see one in the assignment as well um, so Generally speaking, Robocop Junior Rescue Line, follow the lines at junctions. If there's a green square before the junction, turn in that direction. If there's no green square, go straight across the junction. Uh, there can be gaps in the lines. There can also be obstacles. One of the ones they do sometimes is they get a little uh, thing like a, a soft drink can and they put it on top of the line and you just use the line sensor and you see that it's there and you have to go around it. Uh, different obstacles, different challenges in different years. 
Um, but so rather than just try and program this for you uh, in the browser here, I'm going to get you to do a couple of versions. Um, the first version will do with line turtle. Uh, there aren't any physical obstacles, but it can do the line sensing part of it. And well, it's still turtle graphics. When you see to go forward a certain distance, it does go forward exactly that distance. Later on, we'll introduce a little version that has a simplified physics simulation. And so that introduces new problems because, you know, maybe the two motors driving the two wheels, they're not quite as strong as each other. And so maybe you've got a little bit of bias and you say to go forwards uh, however far, but it's also going to end up veering slightly in one direction because one wheel is going to go slightly faster than the other. Maybe there's an obstacle that's in your path and you've got a, a range sensor that you can spot it and have to go around it. Uh, but we'll see some of those uh, in some exercises. And in the meantime, thank you for listening.